Hello booktube, my name is Elizabeth. Welcome or welcome back to my channel, Bookies and Books. In this video, I'm going to talk about two events that I want to take part in in November. Well, at least one of them starts it. One of them is in November, the other one starts in November and ends whatever it ends. Uh, and it's not so much a reading event. So the second one is the Read What You Own Challenge, which is more an exercise in self-restraint, self-sacrifice, <laughs> self-immolation. <laughs> it, it's an exercise in, in something, uh, but I'm going to talk about it later. I'm going to start with the straightforward reading event, which is World War November. This one is a reading event lasting all November long, and we are invited to read about World War One. as simple as that. So the hosts are Tristan from Tristan and the Classic, Christy Lewis from Dostoevsky in Space, uh, Peg from The History Shelf, Bill Rutenberg, and Chelsea from Voyage of a Time Wanderer. And as I said, we are invited to read about World War I. There are various prompts, however, I'm not really going to focus on them. There's also themes. So within the prompts, there are themes. Uh, well, I, I don't know exactly how it works. Uh, so I think the prompts were read a memoir, read a poem, read a book about World War I, and watch a movie about World War I. So these are the basic prompts. But within that, we are also invited to explore other aspects of the war, such as uh, journalism and propaganda, conscientious objectors, and uh, the, the subject that Chelsea, uh, uh, proposed, uh, which is um, the colonial aspect of the war, because this was a war of empires. And at the time, Canada, for example, did not have a word to say about its participation in the war. When Britain declared war on Germany, Canada was at war de facto. The Parliament did not vote on that because Canada was not master of its foreign affairs. It was part of the empire and the empire was at war. And that was that. And it was the same thing for many other colonies, but pretty much all the other colonies of uh, the United Kingdom. So uh, I think this is a very interesting aspect. And of course, I'm going to focus a bit more on my little corner of that uh, big colonial empire, which is the French speaking part of Canada. And mainly the province of Quebec. Uh, so uh, I have a book that I want to read. I found at the library. It is Montreal at War, 1914 to 1918 by Terry Kopp uh, uh, with Alexander Mavra. Uh, so as the title says, it's about uh, Montreal and how it reacted to World War One. Um, Montreal is in a particular situation. There's a strong minority of Anglophones within the minority of Francophones in Canada. So it had really two aspects. Um, there was two attitudes in Canada. Well, I guess in many countries, but particularly in Canada, it was uh, uh, the, the, the difference in attitude was um, was reflected in the linguistic divide of the country and also a bit the religious divide of the country, which at the time was not quite equal, but almost. So on one side, you had the uh, sons of England, sons of Britain, uh, whose parents were born in Britain or grandparents or who had very strong ties with the uh, European country of England, uh, England, Britain, the United Kingdom. Um, and whenever Britain declared war on Germany, they were very happy and very and eager to defend king and empire. They felt very much part of that empire. On the French side, uh, the British were kind of the invader, a little bit, the oppressor. They were other. They, they were not necessarily, um, it, it was not so much, uh, it was not that bad, but it, it was not good. Uh, the English were others. There was no point for French Canadians to go defend the King of England in general. Of course, I'm generalizing. There are uh, exceptions and each individual may react in their own way. Uh, but uh, generally, collectively, French Canadians did not care for the King of England. And then there was some sort of effort to try to link it to France because France and England were allies at least. So they go defend France. We have to defend the mother France and the, the, the origin of our culture and all of that. But the thing is, French Canadians had been more or less isolated for 150 years. France lost the colonies, so North America, to uh, England in 1760. So since 1760, there had been basically no link between French Canadians and France. Uh, so the vast majority of French Canadians did not have family in France. They did not have grandparents in France or cousins or anything like that. They hadn't been there for five generations. Uh, so the, the, the eagerness to go defend France, it was a bit, it was more intellectual and it was more in the upper classes, the educated classes, which was not the majority of the people in French Canada. So uh, th that is an interesting dynamic and I thought it would be fun to explore it. So in this book, in Montreal, we have both sides. There's a strong English minority and there is, of course, the French majority. Um, and in this, we follow, I think, two, is it two regiments? 
So I'm going to read the back a little bit. Drawing from newspaper, journals, government reports, and archival records, Terry Cup, one of Canada's leading military historians, tells the story of how citizens in Canada's largest city responded to the challenges of the First World War. Montreal at War addresses responses to the outbreak of the war in Europe and the process of raising an army for service overseas. It details the shock of intense combat and heavy casualties, studies the mobilization of volunteers and follows the experience of battalions from Montreal to the Battle of Vimy Ridge. So it covers quite a wide range. Uh, and that's going to be interesting. Um, I also thought, okay, well, if we are invited to read a memoir. I'm going to read a memoir by a French Canadian soldier. So I looked up. And now I've changed my mind. Now I want to read all the memoirs written or rather published by French Canadian soldiers. And that is a grand total of two. Two memoirs were published that I found. Perhaps there are others, but at least for the province of Quebec, two memoirs have been published, not three, two. And for a grand total, the two put together of 260 pages. One of them is 150 pages and the other one is 110 pages. And both of them come from officers from the same regiment, which was the 22nd Regiment, also known as the Van Dues. That's it. There's nothing else. Uh, it kind of shows a lack of enthusiasm from French Canadians for the war. Um, so uh, one of them I actually have already read because I'm filming this on November 4 um, and it's been three days since November. So I had time to read an entire memoir. So half my job is done. So the one that I've read is, uh, well, there's no point showing you a cover because I read it in electronic format and I don't think it is translated in English. If I translate the title word for word, it would be Souvenirs and Impressions from My Soldier's Life by uh, Arthur Joseph Lapointe. Arthur Joseph Lapointe, if I pronounce it in French. And the title in French is Souvenirs et Impressions de ma vie de soldat. So I read this man's memoir. Um, and the first thing I noticed was the, the foreword, and he signed it from his village where he wrote, where he was born and where he came back after the war. And that is Saint Ulric. Is it Saint Ulric? Good grief. Um, if you, if you start from Montreal, you take the road on the south shore of the St. Lawrence River, you drive for about five hours, and at some point you see St. Ulrich on your left. So it's really between the main road and the, the, the shore of the St. Lawrence. But at the same place, there's also a sign telling you to turn right if you want the village of St. Leandre, and that's the village where my father was born. So, uh, and born and raised. And I thought, okay, everybody in those villages are related because these are small places. Everybody knows everybody. So I'm going to ask, are we related to that man? Because I know we are related to some lap points. And yes, we are. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> it, the best way I can present this is that uh, the author's so, so the author is the same generation as my grandfather, so that, that would be the equivalent of generation. And the author's paternal grandmother and my grandfather's grandfather were siblings. So that would make my grandfather and the author's second degree cousins. So that, that's uh, how I'm related to that, uh, to that author. Um, and he talks about uh, leaving the village. He doesn't talk so much about his reason why he enlisted. It's more that he felt like it was his duty. And he talks about... Uh, we, we follow him from him leaving Canada, so we don't see the training in the Canadian military base of Valcartier. He's just leaving Canada, getting to the uh, to England, to the plains of Salisbury, and uh, the rain, the mud, uh, the, the miserable conditions, and then going to France. And at first I thought, oh no, this is going to be an all rosy, all um, to um, sort of positive experience of the war. And as because at first he, he was really eager and enthusiastic and talking about his duty and all of that. And I thought, oh, that's going to be a good boy's memoir. And yes, it is a good boy's memoir, not that he did anything wrong. Uh, but um, as we go, it gets darker and darker and darker. And I cried at the end. It's not because of the war. When he came back, um, so he, he was just... Um, he, he, he enlisted in 1916, in January 1916. About six to eight months later, at the end of the summer, he moved to England. So uh, it took eight months of training before getting to England. And then uh, by spring of 1917, he was in France. So after one year of combat, he was recommended to become an, an officer. So he went back to England and trained to become an officer and he became an officer in October of 1918. So he was all proud of that. And then um, he, he got sick a little bit. There was this disease that was going around and that is what we call today the Spanish flu at the time. It didn't really have a name. Um, and uh, so he, he got sick from that and 
ended up in the hospital and the armistice was declared and he knew he was going home because the war was over. Uh, one of his friends had received a letter. He was from the same village and um, from that friend, he sort of understood that members of his family had been sick and had died and he ended up learning that he had lost one brother and two sisters. And when he came back, he was told that, no, it's not one brother and two sisters that you've lost. It's three brothers and two sisters and they died in the span of nine days. So that man left the country, he had five brothers and when he came back, he had one. And it's not the war that killed them, it was the Spanish flu. Anyway, I cried at the end, but um, anyway, the, the, the entire description and the, the experience, it's very moving, very vivid. So if you read French, I heartily recommend it. It's 110 pages. It reads super well. It's really good. Uh, the other one uh, is a memoir by uh, Claudius Cordelou. And just when I read that name, I thought, well, that's not a French Canadian name. And indeed, it is not a French Canadian name. It is an, a French name. Uh, this man was actually born, I'm tempted to say in France, but the thing is, he was born in Germany because he was from Alsace. And this is one of the regions that was the, the ping pong ball between Germany and France. And in 1869, that part belonged to France. And then in 1870, it became German. And then after the World War I, it re-became France. And then during World War II, it re-became German. And then after World War II, it re became France again. So that man was born in Alsace, but was very much of French culture. So uh, he left what was then Germany, I guess. He left Alsace and he enrolled in the Foreign Legion in France, so to, to gain French citizenship. Um, and then he moved to Canada, and as soon as war was declared, he enlisted. Um, so his perspective is a bit different because he has a direct link with France. Uh, he, he was not technically born there, but he, he's been there and he had the citizenship. So that's going to be interesting too. Apparently his memoir focuses a bit more on the history of the 22nd Regiment. Uh, so it's going to be another aspect of, of the war. So there's that. Uh, so other than that, I also intend to read some novels um, or rather reread some novels. Uh, I have this, The Wars by Timothy Findlay, that I read a number of years ago and that I completely forgot. I don't remember. I, I know it's about World War One, but beyond that, I have very little recollection of that book. Um, another book that I would like to reread is Wooden Crosses by Roland Dorgelès. And I also could read other books, other novels by... Um, uh, French authors who actually went to war. Uh, I'm thinking of three of them, so that's one. Uh, the other one that I'm thinking of is The Bloody Hand by Blaise Sandrard, and the other one that I'm thinking of is the one by Henri Barbus. Um, I, I forgot the title, Under Fire, Under Fire by Henri Barbus. Uh, so I'm going to leave all the titles in the description box. Um, so I, I, I'm tr I would like to read them. Will I have time to read all of that? I don't know, because I'm also reading this little thing for nonfiction November. So uh, I don't know how much time I will have. But th this is a little bit what I am interested about reading in uh, about World War I. Um, Tristan also mentioned the courage of cowards about conscientious objectors. And that could be very interesting too. So maybe uh, I'm also going to keep an eye on that one. Perhaps I'm going to read that one too. So now moving on to our second event, which is not so much a reading event as a non-buying event. It is the Read What You Own Challenge. This one is hosted by Ollie from Criminology, Greg from Another Bibliophile Reads, uh, MJ from Reading This Life, and Crystal from Fiber Artsy. Um, the idea is to stop just buying books that you put on your shelves and don't read. For me, this is a sample. These are all books I haven't read. Um, and read what you own. And there are levels. You can go for the platinum level, which is 100 books. You can go for the gold level, 75, the, um, the silver level at 50 books, and the uh, bronze level at 25. Uh, last year, I playfully said, well, I'm going for the snowflake level of 10. And apparently, the name stuck because Alan from Big Hard Books and Classic is also going for the snowflake level of 10. Am I going again for the snowflake level of 10? Or am I trying for the bronze level of 25? Or am I not bothering at all? I am hovering between snowflake and not bothering at all uh, because um, <laughs> I love to buy books and it's, it's, it's a good stress relief for me. I just go to a bookstore and buy some books and, and I'm going to... Um, 
I'm going to get rid of some books because some books I bought at either a sale, library sale, or uh, this summer I bought 10 books for $10 without knowing what they were, and some of them I know I'm not going to read. So I might as well just get rid of them. So if, if, so to two possibilities, either I'm going for just a straightforward 10 books, I read 10 books of my own books without buying anything, without acquiring anything. I shouldn't say just buying because uh, little free libraries are also an issue for me. I just walk around and I, oh, a little book and I buy, bring some book homes, some books home and uh, I end up not reading them because in the little free library, there's perhaps, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 books. And one of them looks very tempting, but it's very tempting among the about 15, 20 that are there. When I bring it home and put it in my pile of 200, it, it's not necessarily that attractive anymore. So perhaps some of those I could take back to little free libraries or actually the, the thing is I should refrain from taking little books from little free libraries. Um, so so either it's 10 books with the rules are I buy nothing, I acquire nothing, I can read books from the library and from script, they don't break the, they don't break the, 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 um, the sequence but they don't count for the sequence either. So there's that option. The other option is to go for 25 and to add on so many rules, <laughs> so many caveats. So if I go for 25, uh, again, the library books and books from script, oh, it has changed name now. It's called Endeavor. I don't like it. I preferred script. Anyway, uh, so either books from or from Project Gutenberg or from some other sources like ebooks that I don't really pay for and library. So books that books that don't stay with me. So these would not count towards the sequence and they don't break the sequence. So that that's that stays. But if I go for the 25 level books, unread books that I unhaul would count towards the sequence. I would place an exception for any books I bring from my parents' house because they are thinking of downsizing and one of the things that you do for downsizing is that you get rid of things that you will not use, including books. And I don't want to miss out on these books just because I'm on a no-buy challenge or something like that. So these books would not count. So they wouldn't break the sequence. However, if I, did, if I did, do bring one book home from my parents' place and I read it, I would count it towards the sequence of 25. So th that's really asymmetrical. I'm cheating in a way because I'm acquiring books that are not counting as breaking the sequence. And if I read them, they do count towards the sequence. So it's a bit, it's kind of cheating. And the other kind of cheating would be a preset list of books, not pre-orders, but a preset list of books. Uh, I'm going through very slowly, <laughs> rather painfully, a renovation project. At this point, it's just still a project. I still haven't paid for anything. It's just I'm thinking about it. It's very, very stressful to me. And one of the things that I did in my little notebook where I keep track of everything that I need to do and want to do is that I made a list of rewards and that is a list of books. And the books that I write on that list, I may buy. Um, so that's, it's a list of expensive books. They are $50 each or something like that. Um, uh, like the, the new translation uh, of The Odyssey by Emily Wilson. So that's one that is there. Um, the other ones are in French. Uh, there's a collection, a, an omnibus series of uh, all the works of Dostoevsky. And I have one book of them and there are four others. And I think I would like to buy the other four. They would look great on my new bookshelves because yes, my renovation projects involves new bookshelves. So uh, these books wouldn't count either towards, like they wouldn't break the sequence, but if I do buy them and then read them, they would count towards the 25. So that would be doubly, doubly cheating. So, uh, so I don't know yet what I'm going to do. And I may end up just ignoring the challenge anyway, because eh, I like to buy books. Um, so I guess I, I have to decide now. <laughs> I have to decide now because if I make a video about it, it's just not to say while well, I'm thinking about it. I have to decide because it starts on November 6th and that, that is Monday. That That is, uh, as a filming, it's tomorrow. It's tomorrow. Or is it in two days? Anyway, it's soon. Uh, so I have to decide. Um, It's hard. I'm going to go for the snowflake level of 10, just a straightforward snowflake level of 10. And if I bring book home, bring books from my parents' house, then it's just going to break the sequence and that's that. That's it. 
So it's a no pressure snowflake level of 10. That's it. And I may unhaul some books. They may count towards the 10. Perhaps I could do it a bit like MJ in, in stretches of 10. If I do 10 and then I'm allowed to buy a book and then another 10 and then... Anyway, I'm thinking about it. I'm not deciding anything. Well, snowflake level. Snowflake level. Okay, I go for the snowflake level of 10 books. I read 10 of my own books before I buy any other book. Is that a deal? That's a deal. It's a deal with me. I am reading 10 of my own books without acquiring any other books. Okay, I'm happy with that. <laughs> That's it. So thank you everyone for watching. Let me know in the comments, are you participating in World War November or in the mad challenge of read what you own challenge? Are you trying for the level of 100? I think you're crazy. <laughs> no, you're not crazy if you do that. It's a, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good thing. I suppose if you have hundreds of books that are unread, um, for me, I, I love buying books too much. So just 10, 10 is enough. 10. So uh, I will see you in the next video. À la prochaine.